In the workshop, a Cotswold Heritage Atlas Steam Plant Part 6, making the parts for the steam turret. I'm going to make the steam turret out of this piece of brass. It's half an inch square and I need to chop it into three pieces. The main part that will support the whistle and the valves is three inches long and this steam turret is going to have two upright columns to support the cross piece and these columns are two and a half inches long. Time to cut the bar to length using my trusty old bandsaw. And in case you're wondering, this bandsaw is a Draper horizontal vertical metal cutting bandsaw. And I know that because it says it on a label on the saw itself. Here are the parts loosely put together in the approximate position. And I'm aware that it does look like something from the film Spinal Tap. It's a mini Stonehenge, but it's not going to end up looking like this. The microcosm siren whistle will fit in the middle, facing to the right, because it's no good if it faces towards you so that you blow the whistle and get a face full of steam. It's over to the milling machine for the first part of the job. I need to cut these two vertical columns to be exactly the same length. So I've mounted them in the machine vise and they clamped very tightly. I used a set square to make sure that they were vertical and here I'm using a small milling cutter to machine the top. You will notice that I'm cutting from front to back. Normally I would move the milling table from right to left and left to right but if I did that then the two pieces of brass may move out of true particularly when I take deeper cuts like this one. I could have put these two pieces of brass in the machine vise sideways and used the side of the milling cutter to trim them off, but I thought just for a change I would do it this way. And you will also notice that I'm moving the milling table away from me so that the rotation of the cutter is always pressing against the work. Once I've made a cut it's okay to go back the other way, but as a general rule when milling, it's a good idea to always traverse the work towards the cutter so that the work meets the cutting edge of the end mill rather than the other way around. I removed the burrs on the edges using my belt sander, then I reversed the two pieces in the milling vise. And once again I made sure that the two pieces of brass were set square in the milling vise using a set square. My apologies for the pun. When the milling was finished, I once again cleaned off the burrs on the edges and now it's over to the lathe. In this clip, I'm offsetting the top slide. That's because I want to turn a taper on these two columns, almost to match the four columns that hold the engine together. But the first thing to do is to accurately centre drill one end of each of the pieces of brass. Eventually, I will drill part of the way down the columns using a drill which will be tapping size for 2BA to mount the finished turret to the baseboard. But for the moment I'm just centre drilling these parts and the centre drill is going in exactly the same depth on both of them. In case you're wondering why my lathe is making such a strange noise it's because it's very cold in the workshop and the belt is slipping. With the column held in the forge or self-centering chuck right near the edge, the other end of the piece of brass that I centre drilled is now supported by a live centre. And until I finish this turning job, I need to make sure that the tailstock cannot move. And here I'm locking the quill in position. Once again, it's bad practice I'm sure, but I'm using a parting tool to do this, because it's quite a heavy duty parting tool, and it's the right kind of shape to get a good finish. So the tailstock's locked in position, and the saddle is also locked in position. All movements of the lathe tool are now controlled by my winding of the handle. I've speeded up the process, it took quite a long time to do this, and it made my arm ache. But eventually, as you can see, the desired effect was achieved. And here they are. It's like an upmarket version of Stonehenge now. Relax, it's not painting time. I'm just coating this piece of brass with engineer's blue that was kindly sent to me by a man called Norman. And now, not only can I see my marking outlines, I can write on the parts to tell me which way around they go. Over now to my drilling machine, and I'm sorry about it wobbling about, I never did get round to bolting it to the floor. I've never liked this drilling machine. That's why I didn't bother bolting it to the floor. The motor capacitor went very early in its life, and I have to rotate the chuck by hand to make it go in the direction I want it to go. So I'm definitely going to buy a new one as soon as I get round to it. The only good thing about this drilling machine is that it has a handle to allow me to wind the table up and down. 
and it has a light, but I never use that. And there's also some play in the spindle as well. On the other hand, my old Smart and Brown lathe is an excellent machine, and I'm using it at the moment to profile the end of the crossbar. First of all, I turn a register on one end, then I use a centre drill followed by a twist drill to drill all the way through it. And the twist drill is tapping size for quarter by 40 threads per inch. And it's 7 30 seconds of an inch in diameter. That's one side done. Time to reverse the part in the chuck and do exactly the same at the other end. I'm making both ends of this piece of bar the same. I'm not using any measuring equipment other than my calibrated eye. And how do you get a calibrated eye? Well, you practice. The more you do, the easier it becomes. In case you're wondering why I only centre drilled this part initially, that's because I didn't want to drill all the way through, because what would happen is as the drill went down the centre and met the cross holes, there's a good chance it would foul up and break off. Initially, I used a 7 30 seconds of an inch drill to drill all the holes tapping size for quarter by 40, but I drilled the two holes underneath the crossbar with a quarter inch drill to locate the columns. And the quarter of an inch diameter holes are uppermost in this image. In the next episode, I'll be threading all the other holes, quarter by 40 threads per inch, and silver soldering the parts together into one unit. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.